madam and dear students i am welcome I have all been come to your house from Reza Ahmed D and Jackie to and all my students. He has accepted our invitation to to come. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, Good evening, students. This is Dr. Guru Sandhya Sarvana Parama. I'm working as a consultant anesthesiologist in Kumaran Medical Center, Kwanatur. And today I'll be discussing about the pulmonary function test and assessment for lung resection surgeries. So uh, any for any surgery, whenever you take up a patient for a surgery, especially for a thoracotomy okay. or any high risk surgeries like cardiac surgeries okay. or so, you always ask for the history, physical examination, you do the laboratory investigations and imaging techniques. And in particular, if the patient is undergoing a thoracotomy or any high risk surgeries, pulmonary function plays a very important role. So what are pulmonary function tests? Pulmonary function tests or batteries of studies or maneuvers, they are performed using standardized okay. equipment to assess the lung function. So what are these pulmonary function tests made of is, what are these pulmonary function test studies is, first one is the lung mechanics, wherein we inhale and an exhale, then is the parenchymal function, and then is the cardiopulmonary interaction, wherein the interaction between the right heart and left heart and the lungs is studied. Then, so what are the indications for pulmonary function test is, it can be either diagnostic or prognostic, Diagnostic as in case of evaluation of any symptoms like cough or dyspnea or screening of address patients such as who are having a occupational exposure and if you want to screen the patients regularly okay. then you can screen for at risk patients and preoperative risk stratification and monitoring for drug therapy as in case of any cytotoxic agents or if given an amiodarone wherein the patient is showing signs and symptoms of pulmonary fibrosis even then even before the patient shows any signs and symptoms of cytotoxicity the patient will actually have changes in their pulmonary function test and you can monitor the drug toxicity via our pft so what is prognosticating is you assess the severity whether it is mild whether it has progressed from mild to moderate from moderate to severe and you ask for assess the response to therapy like whether the bronchodilator therapy is helping them or it is not helping them what are the treatment goals you are going to set for and you categorize the disability with the pft so what are the indications preoperatively to see way back gave us a guideline which is very vague saying any patients who is above 70 years who is morbidly obese undergoing a thoracoabdominal surgery with a history of smoking and any pulmonary disease you have to take that patient for a pft so uh, almost most of the patients would be getting a pft so accp which is an american chest physician guidelines gave us the patients who are undergoing lung resection who are as a smoker or has an unexplained dyspnea who is undergoing a cardiac upper or lower abdominal surgery and who has a uncharacterized pulmonary symptoms should undergo a preoperative pulmonary function test to risk stratify them as having a mild risk intermediate risk or severe high risk for a postoperative pulmonary complication so what are the contraindications any patient who has got a recent myocardial infarction or unstable angina within one month any patient who has got a vascular aneurysm uh, thoraco abdominal wherever it may be or who has an active hemoptysis who has a, underwent a recent ocular surgery or who has a pneumothorax is contraindicated from doing a pft so these pulmonary function tests can be divided into bedside lung function test which tests for vital capacity and dynamic test and which will test the lung mechanics which includes the dynamic and static lung volumes and which are parenchymal function that can be a gas exchange or diffusion capacity and that involves a cardiopulmonary interaction is a six minute walk test or an oxygen consumption or cardiopulmonary exercise testing 
Split lung function test is the one which is done very rarely and three legs tool is employed to predict the patients who will undergo uh, extubation on table or who will undergo a elective postoperative outcome and it predicts the patients who are prone to have an increased postoperative pulmonary complication. So what are bedside PFTs? This can be very well asked in an uh, exam question in a theory as well as um, in practical examination. What is a bedside PFT you will do for this patient? So those which test the vital capacity is Sabras's breath holding test and Sabras's single breath count test. And those which test the vital capacity and the dynamic function is Snyder's mlash blowing test, forced expiratory time, cough test, Debenos whistle, and Wright's peak expiratory flow meter. And the others are arterial blood gas analysis, which can give us a clue about the oxygenation, ventilation, and the metabolic events per se. And the pulse oximeter, which gives us a clue about the room air saturation as well as the pulse rate. And respiratory rate is again a bedside uh, pulmonary function test because any patient in the post-operative period or perioperative period who has got an increased respiratory rate will eventually have a respiratory muscle fatigue and is prone to have a post-operative hypoxemia which can end up in a perioperative pulmonary complication. So one which tests the vital capacity is Sebras's breath holding test. How do, you, how do you do this is you ask the patient to take a full breath and then hold like this. So how am I able to hold? If I'm able to hold for 25 seconds, then I have a normal cardiopulmonary reserve. If the patient is able to hold only for less than 15 seconds, then it is a poor cardiopulmonary reserve. This Sabras's breath holding test can be indirectly used to assess the vital capacity. How? If the breath holding time is somewhere between 20 to 25 seconds, then the vital capacity is somewhere around 3000 ml. If it is only 10 to 15 seconds, then the vital capacity is somewhere around 2000 ml. So we can remember it as like 20, 25 and 30. So 15 to 20 seconds, the vital capacity will be 2500 ml and so on. So which predicts the uh, postoperative pulmonary complication or uh, increased risk is less than 15 seconds. Next is Sabras's single breath count. So you take a deep breath. One, two, three, four, five, six. So if I'm able to count for more than 20 without expiring and taking a next breath, then I have a good cardiopulmonary reserve. If it is less than 10, then it is a poor cardiopulmonary reserve. Then is the test for vital capacity and dynamic function. First is the Snyder's match blowing test. So Snyder's match blowing test, this will actually estimate the maximum breathing capacity of a patient. In a quiet room, you will be asked to sit with the mouth wide open with no pursing of lips. There should be no movement of air in the room and mouth and the mat should be at the same level. And the match is usually kept at six inches with the chin rested and supported. So if there is pursing of lip, there will be a positive airway pressure which is generated and hence there should be no pursing of lips. So if the patient is able to blow at 6 inches, if the patient is able to blow at 6 inches, then you can say the FEV1 is actually more than 1.6 liters per minute. Oslin then modified us if a patient is able to blow at 9 inches then the maximum breathing capacity is somewhere more than 150 liters per minute but if the patient is able to blow only at 3 inches then the maximum breathing capacity is only around 40 liters per minute so if it is at only 3 inches then the patient is going to have an increased pulmonary complication then this Grinny's Barovich cough test. This test would become obsolete in uh, nowadays because of the influenza and the COVID which we have gone through. So you, what you would do is you ask the patient to take a deep breath and then cough. What do we assess this? You assess the strength of the patient, the respiratory muscle strength, the effectiveness of the cough. And if the cough is really productive, as in case of a chronic bronchitis or a bronchiectasis, then the patient is going to land up in a pulmonary complication. When do we, if the patient is coughing very in, inadequately, like <laughs> then the FEV1 is less than 15 ml per kg, FVC is less than 20 ml per kg, and PEFR, which is a peak expiratory flow rate, is less than 200 liters per minute, then the patient is going to have a post-operative pulmonary complication. 
then is the forced expiratory time wherein you ask the patient to take a deep breath and then expire or exhale maximally you keep a step over the trachea and you count for how many seconds the patient is actually exhaling the normal is somewhere close to 3 to 6 5 seconds and if it is more than 6 seconds then it indicates an obstructive disorder and if the breathing falls short of 3 seconds then it is actually more of a restrictive disorder the right speak expiratory flow meter and depenos whistle so what do we do is ask the patient to inhale deeply to total lung capacity and exhale forcefully and that it indicates the into this spirometer which is a pre expiratory flow meter and that will indicate the pf for flow in male it is 450 to 700 liters per minute and in female it is 350 to 500 liters per minute anywhere less than 350 liters per minute will indicate ineffective cough this is debenos whistle which is a good old machine wherein you blow into that whistle the maximum leak will indicate the maximum pf for so as of now we have seen only the bedside pfts which is the test for vital capacity vital capacity and dynamic function now coming on to lung mechanics which is actually studied by a spirometer which is developed which was developed by john hutchinson way back in 1900s uh, we would have done in our physiology lab wherein there would be a drum we would be connecting ourselves with the belt to the drum and the drum will mark the graph maybe <clears throat> that is the spirogram or the vitalograph that uh, spirometer used to mark what is the spirometer study is the static lung volumes and capacities and with the spirometer we can do a dynamic maneuver and assess the flow volume loops volume time loop pressure volume loop and see for the respiratory muscle strength so for a pft or a spirometry to be acceptable there are acceptability criteria and reproducibility criteria for a spirometry to be undergone we need to educate the patient as they have to inhale maximally exhale maximally over the spirometer which they give us so there should not be any artifact and normally the exhalation should last for 6 seconds with the volume time plateau at least for 1 second there should not be any leak provided they have given a spirometer uh, to blow if the patient is having a leak and blowing out of the spirometer then the spirogram or vitalograph will not be proper and hence there should not be any leak the patient should not have any premature glottic closure or cough during the spirogram or spirometry wherever we are taking what is a reproducible criteria is you take a maximum of 3 efforts and you given an average for 3 efforts so given the largest forced vital capacity and the next largest forced vital capacity there should not be a gap of more than 200 ml between the two so the if you say the largest fvc is say somewhere around 3.8 liters and the next largest fvc should be around 3.6 liters to say it is a reproducible criteria suppose if the first fvc was around 3.6 liters and the second fvc trace gives somewhere around 2 liters then it is not a reproducible criteria acceptable then you define that you ask the patient to take next attempt and then uh, see the fvc value and you accept that pft if it is within this 200 ml target range the largest fvc and the next largest fvc the same thing should not have more than 200 ml gap you ask the patient to take a maximum of 8 efforts only if there is no reproducible criteria which is fitting in with this maximum of 8 efforts you ask the patient to take some rest give their adequate rest and then repeat the spirometry until you get a reproducible criteria and then acceptability criteria so this is a spirometry graph and this is a vitalograph so here uh, as you can see the two lines this this is one spirometry uh, spirometrogram and then next is these are two efforts which are made by the patient they are close to each other and hence this can be taken as an acceptable effort but here as you can see the graph falls short every time the patient is making an effort so this is a sub maximal effort that the patient is making and hence this is not acceptable
and here the patient has tried to cough in between the spirogram so this is also not at all acceptable so here you can see this part of the graph is inspiration and hence this patient has made a very suboptimal effort in inspiratory part of the curve and hence this is also not acceptable in this vitalograph if you see these two graphs this has plateaued for more than one second and you can this is the volume time graph and this can be taken as somewhat six seconds and this is a good effort this the patient has taken submaximal effort consequently and this is not at all acceptable as i told the exhalation should at least extend for six seconds here the patient has prematurely terminated their breath or had a glottic closure and hence this pft is also not acceptable and here the patient had tried to cough and hence this is not an acceptable pft so coming on to lung volumes and capacities so there are four volumes and four capacities capacities are derived from adding two or more uh, lung volumes and lung volume what is the tidal volume is any amount of air which you take in or breathe out during a quiet respiration is tidal volume any amount of air which you are able to inhale after the tidal volume resting tidal volume the maximum amount of air you are able to inhale is called the inspiratory reserve volume over and above the normal tidal volume range whatever you are going to exhale maximally is called the expiratory reserve volume whatever amount of air which is remaining in the lungs after a maximal inspiration followed by a deep expiration that amount of air which is remaining in the lungs is called the residual volume just a second closing volume and closing capacities we'll discuss it later so uh, i hope i'm clear with erv irv tidal volume and residual volume what are capacities is these are derived from adding two or more lung volumes so what is inspiratory capacity which is ic is tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume is inspiratory capacity tidal volume plus expiratory reserve volume is expiratory capacity what is forced uh, sorry functional residual volume is that amount of air which is remaining in the lungs after a tidal breathing is called as the functional residual capacity this functional residual capacity is affected by our anesthetic agents is it is affected by the position and and this is the buffer of against which we are dealing day in and day out while we are pre oxygenating this is the source of oxygen which you are trying to utilize when you are going to denitrogenate and pre oxygenate the patient and this gives us a uh you when you read the lung mechanics you would have known an already inflated balloon is very easy to inflate and this frc gives us that res, uh, volume which is remaining in the lungs and it actually decreases the work of breathing whenever we are breathing so this frc is very important as an anesthetist with only after you extubate if you are going to keep the patient completely supine then the frc will be very less that is why once you extubate you are actually giving a head up position so that you will increase the frc thereby whatever supplemental oxygen you are giving you are actually enriching the frc with oxygen and preventing any hypoxemia in the post operative period or during the intubation period which should occur otherwise and what is total lung capacity is whatever <clears throat> like I mean inspiratory capacity plus expiratory capacity plus residual volume is the total lung capacity then what is vital capacity is except for the residual volume whatever amount of air that is you are maximally inhaling and maximally exhaling accounts for the vital capacity so mitral capacity and functional residual capacity they actually kind of change which their uh, position and the muscle power so anything which will produce an abdominal splinting or you change the position is going to affect the vital capacity so trendelenburg position has got Uh, if you put a patient in a trendelenburg position then there is 14.5% reduction in the vital capacity suppose you say you put the patient in lithotomy then there is 18% reduction in 
vital capacity say if you if a, if your patient is going to undergo a lap assisted vaginal hysterectomy or any vaginal hysterectomy or any procedure which is involving the uh, head down with lithotomy you, then there will be somewhere around 32.5% reduction in vital capacity if they are a normal patient then you will not have any trouble in ventilating them but if the patient has already got a respiratory compromise say they are copd or a restricted lung disease patient in such kind of patients we may land up in trouble when you are giving a deep lithotomy as well as a trendelenburg position even in prone position the vital capacity is decreased somewhere around 10 percentage so what are the normal values these normal values are actually based on height age gender and it, every value is somewhere kind of 20 percent less in females and it is more in person who have uh, who is doing exercise regularly and is an athlete so normal tidal volume is somewhere around 6 to 8 ml per kg inspiratory reserve volume is 1.9 to 3.3 liters and erv is 1.5 liters residual volume is 20 to 25 ml per kg and functional residual capacity is 30 to 35 ml per kg and vital capacity is somewhere around 60 to 70 ml per kg and total lung capacity is close to 6 liters so what are the values which are not measured by spirometry is so here as i said uh, in a normal spirogram whatever you, you are able to inhale and exhale will be surely measured by the spirometer because you are exhaling into the spirometer only but this volume this residual volume is remaining in the lungs so whatever amount of effort you make you are not going to measure this residual volume via your spirometer so residual volume will not be measured via our spirometer so whatever volumes which has residual volume in their formula this, this residual volume is a component of frc this residual volume is a component of total lung capacity and hence this residual volume and total lung capacity closing volume and closing capacity cannot be measured via a spirometer so how do we measure the residual volume is nitrogen washout technique helium dilution technique or body plethysmography and closing volume and closing capacity can be measured via a single breath nitrogen exhalation technique so what are the three methods by which we measure a residual volume is nitrogen washout technique wherein you inhale and exhale 100 percent oxygen the exhaled volume is collected and the concentration of nitrogen is assessed to say what is the residual volume which is present and helium dilution technique here the patient actually takes 7 to 10 breaths of known concentration of helium you breathe in and breathe out of a reservoir depending upon the concentration of helium which is present you are able to find out the residual volume which has a communicating gas volume that is one which involves in the ventilation and gaseous exchange and perfusion so body plethysmography is yet another method where a patient is placed in a body box and based on boyle's law which is actually says which actually says at a constant temperature the volume is inversely proportional to the pressure change so provided that the volume of the box is known and the pressure the uh, drop across the mouth and the chamber is known we can actually derive the residual volume body plethysmography is the only one which will actually say as both the communicating and the non-communicating gas volumes that is one which does not involve in the gaseous exchange also even the vbq lesser areas we are able to find by the body plethysmography this closing volume and closing capacity this may not be a part and partial of pft but it is always prudent to know so what is the closing volume is whenever you expire at some point of time when you are going for um, exhalation the airways tend to close when the pleural pressure will become more of your airway pressure there occurs the equal pressure point beyond which you will not be able to exhale and the airways the smaller airways will begin to close this happens in the dependent areas of the lungs wherein the airways will close and there may be the cessation of respiration or cessation of air flow across the uh, airways whichever it happens so that volume at which the airways in the dependent areas close is called the closing volume so this closing volume as you can see it is made of 
it's it is it is over and above the residual volume but it is below the functional residual capacity as you can see there is a gap between the closing volume and the functional residual capacity so this actually kind of gives a buffer to have a effect against a physiological desaturation but there are certain conditions where in the closing volume will actually encroach upon frc and will become more than that of frc even in the physiological range this happens when the patient is supine so this is a graph of frc when the patient is supine as you can see it is like uh, this is total lung capacity percentage and this is age in years as you can see the frc this is a dotted line which is the uh, functional residual capacity um, in the supine position as you can see when the patient is above 45 years of age so this closing capacity encroaches the above until then it is actually lesser than the functional residual capacity after 40 years when the patient is lying supine it encroaches upon frc and becomes more than that of frc in the supine position this is a graph of the patient being upright this whole blue line is the frc uh, in the upright position as you can see the closing volume is very well below the frc up until 66 years of age after 66 years of age even in the upright position the closing volume is actually more than that of the X, um, frc and this can lead to a physiological desaturation so as of now we have seen only the static lung volumes and capacities now we are moving to the dynamic test so what this is a vitalograph which is the fec maneuver and the fec curve uh, what happens is the patient uh, how will the patient do is the patient will deeply inspire and then exhale maximally over six seconds so for a vitalograph to be acceptable the patient should actually at least exhale to six seconds then this is the fpc curve which is the forced vital capacity maneuver breath so as you can see this is time in seconds this is volume in the y-axis so this is a volume time loop so in time in the x-axis is stated as one second two second and so on so any patient who is actually exhaling in the first second whatever they are exhaling is the forced expiratory volume at one second as you can see in the graph the forced expiratory volume at one second is more or less 80 percent of the total volume which is exhaled the total volume which is exhaled is close to six liters but the fev1 here is somewhere close to 4.5 liters so the fev1 kind of occupies 80 percent of the fec maneuver and this is a normal vitalograph so in here the patient has tried to this is the normal vitalograph this gray one but here the patient has tried to breathe and hence this vitalograph is a not acceptable one so what is a forced vital capacity is it is the volume of air that is exhaled following a maximal inspiration so So whatever you exhale, you exhale maximally after a maximal inspiration. So what it reflects is, it reflects the flow resistive properties of the airway. So normal is somewhere between 80 to 120 percent of predicted. So how will they calculate this predicted is, they, they will have a patient's normal value. They will have a population's normal value. So what is the percentage of predicted the patient has compared to the population value is called the percentage of predicted so anywhere between 80 to 120 percentage of predicted is normal fvc 70 to 79 percentage is mild reduction 50 to 69 percentage is moderate reduction and less than 50 is severe reduction then what is fvv1 as i said whatever the amount of air the patient is going to exhale in the first second is called the fvv1 so even in this graph as you can see the patient the white forced expiratory uh, sorry forced vital capacity is somewhere around four liters and you can see there is 3.2 liters which is the fev1 so more than 80 percent of fvc is achieved the in the first second itself so this is a normal vital graph so it has then 
in here if you see if it is an obstructive disorder as you can see the even in the first second the normal uh, the FVC is somewhere close to 2.5 liters in here 2.5 liters but the FPV1 here is close to only 800 ml so it is grossly decreased in case of an obstructive disorder so normal is more than 80 percent predicted mild obstruction is 60 to 80 moderate obstruction is 50 to 59 and less than 49 is a severe obstruction in case of an fev1 so what is the tiffany index is the fev1 by fec ratio is called as a tiffany's index <clears throat> what is normal more than 80 percent more than 0.8 is normal so how do we differentiate between an obstructive disorder and a restrictive disorder using a tiffany's index is in an obstructive disorder this is a graph of an obstructive disorder. The uh, graph is less than that of a normal curve, but the FVC kind of encroaches the normal FVC because of air trapping. So what happens is the FVV1, is this is the FVV1 here of the normal curve. So, but here the FVV1 is grossly decreased in the obstructive pattern. But when you see the FVC, it is close to normal. So the numerator is grossly reduced, which is the FEV1, but the denominator is kind of maintained. When the numerator is grossly decreased and the denominator is maintained, the FEV1 by FVC will obviously decrease. But in a case of restrictive disorder, this is the normal graph. The FEV1 normal, FVC normal, but here the FEV1 as well as FEC both are decreased. So when both numerator and denominator is decreased, the FEV1 by FEC is maintained or increased in case of a restrictive disorder. In a restrictive disorder, FEV1, FEC, residual lung, residual volume, total lung capacity, all of the lung volumes are decreased in case of a restrictive disorder. So if a Tiffany's index is normal, it can either be a restrictive disorder or it can be normal depending upon the values of FEV1 and FVC and the lung volumes. Then is the maximum breathing capacity. It is actually a volume time parameter. How do we assess this? You ask the patient to maximally inhale and maximally exhale. This is done over a period of 15 seconds and is extrapolated to somewhere around one minute. So normal maximum breathing capacity is somewhere around 140 to 180 liters in male and 80 to 120 liters in female. It can either be calculated as FEV1 into 35 or FEC into respiratory rate. As a bit, it is not actually humanly possible to inhale maximally and exhale maximally to one minute and hence it is done for 15 seconds and extrapolated to one minute. Then coming on to dynamic test. In the dynamic test as of now we have seen the volume time loop alone. Next we are seeing the flow volume loop. So this is a vitalograph which we have seen which is a volume time loop. Now we are going into flow volume loop. So what is a flow volume loop is the volume is measured in the x axis and flow is measured in the y axis. So in case um, we may not take this graph first. So what is measured in this volume time graph is peak expiratory flow meter, maximum mid expiratory flow rate and you can do a flow volume loop assessment. So in here this is a volume in liters. So 0, 1 liter, 2 liter, 3, 4, 5 and this total lung capacity should somewhere be around 6 liters. It's marked 0 but it's actually 6 liters. So this lower part of the curve is called as the inspiratory part of the curve. The patient actually breathes from the residual volume and inspires to the total lung capacity. So this is the inspiratory part of the curve and then the patient exhales from the total lung capacity to residual volume which is occurring after a maximal expiration so this part of the curve will constitute the functional i mean forced vital capacity which is around 4 liters okay so in and this flow volume loop this is the expiratory part of the curve in the expiratory part of the curve the patient makes a maximal effort to breathe and that maximal point is called the peak expiratory flow rate. 
in this the inspiratory part of the curve is totally effort dependent we cannot breathe without the effort so for a maximal effort i'm saying so for a maximal effort you need a patient's maximal attempt so the inspiratory part of the curve is always effort dependent the expiratory part of the curve the initial part of the curve is always effort dependent but the slope of the curve wherein the expiration is ranging from 25% to 75% or the lower part is almost always effort independent so this effort independent part helps us to detect the changes in the smaller airways so as i said this is the effort dependent area suppose the patient is making a very normal effort you say the patient breathes around only the tidal volume inspiring expiring inspiring expiring and this constitutes the functional residual capacity but here the patient is inhaling after a maximal expiration so from a maximal expiration if you start the patient will start from residual volume and not from functional residual capacity so the patient is making a maximal inspiratory attempt from the residual volume to inhale until the total lung capacity suppose you say the patient has made a suboptimal effort so the slope of the curve is somewhere here say the patient only made a modest effort the slope of the curve is here but if the patient is making a maximal effort the pefr increases very proportionately and reaches a maximum point but whatever the effort you put in the in initial part of the curve in the slope of this part of the curve has not changed at all even with the mild effort modest effort suboptimal effort or a maximal effort the curve always drops to residual volume and not more than residual volume so this part of the curve is called the effort independent part whatever amount of effort you are going to put you are going to exhale only to residual volume and not more than that and hence it is a effort independent part so any inspiratory part of the curve is actually divided into four parts which is forced inspiration fraction 25 50 and 75% and the same goes for the exhalation which is forced expiratory fraction 25% 50% and 75% so this is the effort independent part this peak expiratory flow is always a effort dependent part so if you put ratio between fev1 and the fiv fif it is always close to 1 so this is taken as maximum mid expiratory flow that is fef 25% to fef 75% so this is actually effort independent part and it is the most sensitive and earlier indicator of any smaller airway changes normal is more than 60% predicted 40 to 60 is mild obstruction 20 to 40 is moderate obstruction and less than 10 is severe obstruction so with the flow volume loops you can actually assess uh, and find out whether it is an obstructive pattern or it is a restrictive pattern or if there is an extra thoracic obstruction or an intra thoracic obstruction so first we'll see the normal flow volume loop in here the normal flow volume loop is the patient inspiring from tide residual volume to total lung capacity reaching the pefr and again exhaling to residual volume so this is normal first we can take this graph <clears throat> aberin the inspiratory part of the curve is normal similar to the first graph and here if you see the expiratory part of the curve the pefr is kind of maintained here but the expiratory part of the curve expiratory part of the curve the mid portion of the curve alone is scooped out or it is concaving upwards this shows there is decreased fef 25% to 75% but the fev1 which is the maximal exhalation in first second is kind of preserved so this is a early smaller airway obstruction when the airway obstruction becomes very severe the fev1 also is decreased and there is concaving or scooping upward of the exhalation limb and this signifies the obstruction there is significant decrease in the pefr and there is decrease in the fev25 to 75% also so coming on to this pattern this is a dog like appearance of the obstructive pattern which can happen in an emphysema where wherein the fev 25 to 75 wall is grossly affected 
So coming on to restrictive pattern. So these both are clear. Am I clear? Anyone please? Hello? Yeah. Okay, then is the restrictive pattern. So in a restrictive pattern, as I said, the residual volume, total lung capacity, everything is decreased. So if you say, if you uh, somewhere you say the graph starts from 2 liters to 6 liters. Here the graph is starting from only 3 liters to 6 liters. So the total lung capacity is somewhere around 4 liters only. So the total lung capacity is decreased. FEV1 is decreased the total FV, the PEFR is decreased and totally the loop actually kinds of smalls down. This is a restrictive pattern. The inspiratory part of the curve is also affected because of smaller lung volumes. The expiratory part of the curve is also affected because of smaller lung volumes. So in a restriction, the total whole lung volume is decreased. Okay, this is a restrictive pattern. So coming on to fixed airway obstruction, whatever obstruction this graph whatever obstruction is there in a fixed airway obstruction say in a case of a goiter whether you inspire or expire the obstruction is fixed so it affects both parts of the curve inspiration as well as expiration those flattens out in case of a fixed airway obstruction when both loops are affected it is a fixed upper airway obstruction then the obstruction can be intrathoracic or extrathoracic and the variable obstruction. So in case of an intrathoracic obstruction, say a case of a mobile tumor or in case of a vocal cord palsy, when there is an in intrathoracic obstruction, not vocal cord palsy, when there is a uh, tracheomalacia, that is an intrathoracic obstruction. When there is an intrathoracic obstruction, what will happen is uh, whenever you inspire, there is a negative intrathoracic pressure. So that will suck the air in completely. So the inspiratory part of the curve is normal. But when you expire, there is a positive intrathoracic pressure. There is already a luminal variable obstruction in the airway. When there is a positive airway pressure which is building outside, this increased intrathoracic pressure tends to already, there is an airway which is already trying to close because of an obstruction luminally. When there is an increased airway pressure outside, then this kinds of pushes the airway and it tends to close the airway. So the expiratory pattern, it flattens out. So in case of an intrathoracic obstruction, whenever there is increased intrathoracic pressure, the airways will close and the expiratory part of the curve will flatten in case of an intrathoracic obstruction. Suppose there is a variable extrathoracic obstruction. Say the patient has having a OSA. That is a variable thing. Say the patient is having a neuromuscular disorder. That is an extrathoracic thing. Wherein the one at one breath the patient may have one power. And the next breath the patient may take a deep breath and have another power. So OSA and, and neuromuscular disorders. Whenever the patient is taking a deep inspiration or a forced inspiration there is already a negative transmural pressure so whenever the patient is trying to take a very deep breath that will again tend to collapse the airway because there is already a negative pressure inside the airway that happens in case of an osa so the inflate inspiratory part of the curve is affected maximally when there is a variable extrathoracic obstruction so when there is actually an expiration which is happening there is a positive intrathoracic pressure which will decrease the airway obstruction and the expiratory part of the curve more or less remains normal in case of a variable extrathoracic obstruction so next comes the reversibility with the bronchodilator so whatever uh, severity the pft may show you have to assess whether the patient is showing any improvement with the bronchodilator so how to say whether the patient is having a reversibility or not? You take an initial spirometer, the initial flow volume loop. Then you give a bronchodilator. Then after some time, you repeat the PFT. After repeating the PFT, if there is a change of at least 12% in FEV1 and at least 200 ml increase in the FEV1, both should be there to say that the patient has got a reversibility. So whenever there is reversible airway obstruction, it can mean that it 
these these patients are uh, going to benefit from a bronchodilator therapy so in case of an asthma pre treatment the graph will somewhere be like this though they may not reach a normal graph the post treatment graph will definitely have an improvement so that is a bronchodilator challenge then is the pressure volume loop this is the patient who is breathing normally uh, this is an inspiration which leads to a positive pressure then expression again dropping suppose you say the patient has got an osa wherein you have given a cpap till the patient is having a spontaneous respiration the graph kinds of shift to the right and still the patient breathes spontaneously this is the graph of a compliance curve or a volume uh, pressure volume loop of a patient who is having a um, volume controlled mode of ventilation so this graph is used in ARDS or in patient who is ventilated electively uh, to have a optimal peep to say for this is the optimal compliance curve so this curve can also be taken as a part of a compliance curve so the pressure is in x axis and the volume is in y axis so this is the inspiratory part of the curve and this is the expiratory part of the curve so what happens is the, this is the the curve has shifted to right as in case of here because we have applied some peep say 5 cm of water even if you have applied some peep up until certain pressure the alveoli are not going to open only when you apply certain amount of pressure there are some airways which are open here but still when you reach only the lower inflection point which is the minimum pressure which is required to open the alveoli at once once you have reached the minimum recruitment point that is the lower inflection point the curve becomes an optimal compliance curve what happens is what is compliance volume change per unit change in pressure so you have increased the pressure for example i'm saying if it is 1 cm of water the volume is volume of the lung is increasing if you say 2 cm of water the volume of lung is increasing 3 cm of water the volume of lung is increasing 4 cm of water the volume of lung has reached a point wherein you have increased the pressure from 6 7 8 but the volume has remained the same see the volume has remained the same how much amount of pressure you apply after this point it is not going to help you in any gas exchange but it is going to distend the alveoli rather than the alveoli becoming a compliant alveoli so this part of the curve wherein you give some pressure and you exert a volume change the alveoli is called the optimal compliance of the curve so this part of the curve wherein you have applied the pressure but you are not able to see any change in the volume this you can see in real time say you increase the pressure from uh, you have kept peep somewhere around 5 cm you keep on increasing the pc above peep from somewhere around uh, 5 cm you say you will have a tidal volume of 250 Six centimeters, three hundred. Seven centimeters, three fifty. Eight centimeters, four hundred. But when you increase above some point of time, depending upon the compliance of the patient, like say twelve, thirteen, fourteen, the tidal volume will not increase. Which means you have moved from the optimal compliance curve and moved towards the over distension point of the curve. So this point where the over distension begins, the alveoli is actually over distended. So this is the expiratory part of the curve where the pressure at which there is regional over distension. From this point, the patient begins to expire to peep. So lower inflection point is the point where the alveoli is getting recruited. The upper inflection point is the point where the alveoli are actually regionally over distended and there is beaking. Okay. and coming on to respiratory muscle strength this is another dynamic test which is made all dynamic test will whenever we do that actually test the muscle power negative pressure which you generate during the inspiration or positive pressure which you generate during the expiration is actually measured via aneroid gauge meter with the valve and inspiration and expiration the force which is generated with the muscle power is recorded so the normal pi max is minus 125 cm of water and anywhere which is less than minus 25 cm is uh taken as the patient will not be able to cough or take a deep breath following an extubation the pe max is somewhere around plus 200 cm of water and anywhere less than 40 cm of water the patient will not be able to cough 
So where will we use this? Uh, when you say you uh, you are going to reverse the patient and extubate the patient, you say whenever the Pmax is less than 20 centimeters of water, then that is a criteria for weaning. So that should be there because the patient will not be able to take a deep breath once when the values are less than this. So weaning from the ventilation and if the patient is having a neuromuscular disorder, you say that there is a peak inspiratory pressure PI max is only around 5 centimeters of water, minus 5 centimeters of water. Then obviously you need to bridge the patient with somewhere with the BiPAP or CPAP, else the patient is not going to tolerate your extubation and is going to land up in a hypercapnic failure because they are not going to have a, uh, enough tidal volume generation with this PI max. So this is the aneroid gauge meter. As I told, this is PI max, this is PE max. PE max is somewhere close to 200 centimeters of water and PI max is, it is a negative pressure. So it is minus 120 centimeters of water as a normal. So as of now, we have seen only the dynamic test and the static lung volume test and bedside function test. Then is the airway resistance. This normal airway resistance, it's actually kind of shared between the chest wall and the airway, pharynx and the mouth. So the larger airways, they are kind of smaller when compared to the cross-sectional areas in the bronchi and the bronchioles because the bronchi and bronchioles, the total cross-sectional area is very vast. So the airway obstruction, the airway resistance is quite higher in the mouth, nasal passages and the larger airways. That follows that whenever the resistance is very high, the flow is turbulent in the larger airways and it is very laminar in the smaller airways. Also, whenever you are <clears throat> having a um, resistance measurement, what will happen is it can be measured at the residual volume or total lung capacity. In the total lung capacity, what will happen is uh, we have to remember the airways are the one which are airways are also the one which are existing the airway resistance. So in case of total lung capacity, when I inspire deeply and hold up until the total lung capacity, all my airways are open. So when the airway is open, the resistance is obviously kind of decreased. So their airway resistance is least at the total lung capacity. Say when I am exhaling to residual volume after the total lung capacity inspiration. So I have in, inhaled deeply and exhaled. Now I am exhaling totally to residual volume. Now my airways are totally closed. When there is totally closed airway, obviously the airway resistance will be very high. So the resistance of the airways is very high at residual volume and it is very low at high lung volumes, which is the total lung capacity. <clears throat> As you can see in this um, uh, tabular column, the contribution of mouth and the pharynx, the larynx and the larger airways are very high when compared to smaller airways because of their larger cross-sectional area. And there are methods to measure the resistance also, wherein you will put a, a catheter in the esophagus, measure the pleural pressure and find out the resistance as well. And these are the me methods by which you can measure the resistance, which are body plethysmography, interrupter method, forced oscillation method and pressure flow method. Discussing this is beyond the scope of this lecture and hence I'll stop with the methods alone. So next comes the test for gaseous exchange. Just a second. Test for gaseous exchange. One is the alveolar and the arterial partial pressure gradient. What happens is the normal is somewhere around 8 to 25 millimeters of mercury. But then if there is a gaseous exchange defect, then this will not be proper and you will have an increased value. PCO2, pH and bicarb, they show the ventilatory properties and also bicarb and pH can be a reflection of metabolic properties also. Then the important test for gaseous exchange is diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide, <clears throat> which is otherwise called as the transfer factor of lung. What it measures is, it measures the gas exchange between the inhaled gas in the alveoli and the capillaries. So what do you inhale and test for the transfer factor of lung is, you inhale 10% helium, 0.3% of carbon monoxide, which is a non-toxic concentration of carbon monoxide, 21% of oxygen and 68% of nitrogen. <clears throat> you take a single breath of this gas mixture and you inhale to total lung capacity, hold for 10 seconds and you exhale. So the DLCO, which is the diffusion factor, is given by carbon monoxide ml per minute per millimeters of mercury divided by the driving pressure. The driving pressure is nothing but the arterial capillary pressure, capillary uh, 
concentration of the carbon monoxide. The normal is 20 to 30 ml per minute per millimeters of mercury. So you have to know why we have chosen carbon monoxide because it has got very high affinity to hemoglobin. So instantly it can diffuse across the capillary membrane and bind to hemoglobin. The normal concentration of carbon monoxide in the human blood is somewhere around zero. That follows that even in the pulmonary capillaries it is zero. <clears throat> So it is very easy for calculation and hence we have chosen the carbon monoxide which is non-toxic. So any factor which affects the pulmonary, pulmonary alveolar membrane or the pulmonary capillary membrane or the blood flow or the hemoglobin will affect the DLCO that matters that, that makes sense right. So if the hemoglobin itself is low the normal is more than 80% of predicted DLCO. So if it is, if there is anemia, there is no hemoglobin. So obviously the diffusion is going to be decreased. When the alveolar basement membrane itself, the respiratory bronchial itself is damaged by emphysema, then again the transfer is going to be decreased. When there is blood flow occlusion, as in case of pulmonary embolism, it is going to be decreased. When the basement membrane itself is damaged in case of a fibrosis, it is going to be decreased. When there is fluid between the capillaries and the alveolar basement membrane, as in case of pulmonary edema, it is going to be decreased. So that follows that any high polycythemia, any thing which will have an increased drive across the uh, alveolar basement membrane, as in case of exercise or an early congestive failure with a sinus tachycardia, wherein the patient is driving the oxygen out of the alveoli, that can have an increased DLCO. Okay, so as till now we have seen the test for gaseous exchange, we have seen only DLCO. Then is the cardiopulmonary reserve. In the cardiopulmonary reserve, there is a measurement of oxygen consumption. So at rest, how do you measure is we measure <clears throat> the oxygen consumption is somewhere around 250 ml per minute. So when you exercise, the consumption of oxygen will go somewhere up to 20 ml per kg per minute. So how can this be tested in the bedside is you can do a stair climbing test. You ask the patient to climb at least 20 stairs, which is at, at least 6 inches height steps at their own pace without stopping. If the patient is able to climb 5 flights means then the VO2 max is somewhere around 20 ml per kg per minute. If I am able to climb only 2 flights then my VO2 max is only 12 ml per kg per minute. But if I am able to not able to climb even 1 flight then my VO2 max is somewhere less than 10 ml per kg per minute. So these are the patients who are at a higher risk for perioperative complications. Then is the functional walking test. It can be a shuttle walk test incremental shuttle walk test <clears throat> and the endurance the shuttle walk test. What happens in shuttle walk test is the patient walks at their own pace. In the incremental shuttle walk test the patient will increase their pace up until their moment and like there are uh, matched values for the uh, age, gender and their specific uh, uh, genicity or ethnicity that has a value which says this is normal and this is abnormal of the predictor. And in the endurance shuttle walk test as an incremental shuttle walk test, the patient increases their pace. At one point of increasing their pace, they stop at there and then continue walking at that pace and determine the VO2 max. But what is easier at the bedside is the six minute walk test, which you actually see if the patient, let the patient walk around their own pace for around six minutes. You divide it by 30, that gives the VO2 max, how many distance they have walked. If the patient is able to walk only less than 600 meters in 6 minutes means when the VO2 max is less than 15 ml per kg per minute. Why I have a chosen a cyclist is, uh, I think his name is uh, Lance Armstrong who has a maximal VO2 max of somewhere around 84 ml per kg per minute. So this is shuttle walk test where in you keep two shuttles at 10 meters apart. You ask the patient to move at their own pace between the shuttles. So any, uh, you de you de depending upon the distance which they are able to travel, you calculate the VO2 max. Suppose if the patient is walking only less than 250 meters and is having a desaturation of more than 4 percentage, then you say the VO2 max is less than 10 ml per kg per minute and increased risk. Suppose if the patient is going to walk for 350 meters, then the VO2 max is averaging around 11 ml per kg per minute. Then is the cardiopulmonary exercise testing. This involves attaching the patient to an ECG, capnogram, everything. 
as in case of a treadmill the patient can be either asked to walk in their own pace or do one exercise and then we see the cardiopulmonary exercise testing very important point in this is the anaerobic threshold wherein the oxygen consumption exceeds the oxygen demand I mean the oxygen demand exceeds the consumption whatever you are supplying the demand is more than what you supply so since the demand is more the patient will land up in anaerobic metabolism and there will be a point where anaerobic metabolism in enhances and there will be a preponderant increase in the carbon dioxide exhalation at that point that point where the surge of oxygen consumption is increased is taken as the anaerobic threshold anything less than 10 is actually taken as a high risk so normally it can be more than 11 ml per kg per minute what else we measure from cept is maximum oxygen utilization ventilatory equivalent of carbon dioxide ventilatory equivalent of oxygen and the peak heart rate so in cpet uh, the one thing which is important is the anaerobic threshold then is the split lung function test so suppose you say in a thoracotomy you are going to remove one part of a lung and your pft is equivocal you see the ventilation and perfusion to the part of a lung which is going to be removed if the part of the lung which is going to be removed is contributing significantly to the normal ventilation and perfusion then if you remove that part of the lung the patient may land up in complications so you see if the ventilation and perfusion to that part of the lung which you are going to remove is compromised or well maintained you see and assess how will the left right ventricle tolerate the resection and how is the post operative ability for hypoxia and hypercapnia going to be so when you are going to take more than two lobes or more than nine segments or when you are going to do a pneumonectomy in a bilateral lung diseased patient you see which lung is better perfused and ventilated and then decide upon the pneumonectomy which is going to be done okay so in the split lung function test it can again be a lateral position test which is a spirometry and abg which is done in a lateral position because now we are going to do in the thoracotomy in the lateral position only so because the frc and the complaints of the lung will reduce in the dependent lung but obviously response under the anesthesia cannot be predicted even if you do a spirometry in the lateral position so bronchospirometry this is again another invasive test wherein you give a dlt in the anesthetized patients both side of the tube is connected to a spirometer with the containing a hundred percent oxygen so using a radioactive oxygen uptake you determine which lung is getting better perfused which lung is getting better ventilated so post-operative lung functions can be accurately determined but technically in order to find out which part of the lung is better ventilated and better perfused you are going to anesthetize the patient put them under and do all these maneuvers which are quite invasive so this is not uh, technically feasible in our part of the country and it cannot combine this with the excise testing then comes to the radio spirometric v by q scan what do you do use you use xenon for ventilation and technetium 99 for perfusion you see the regional perfusion ventilation and lung volumes of the deceased part of the lungs and you determine whether the resection of that particular part of the lung will be tolerated by the patient in the post-operative period this is yet again a very very invasive test like temporary unilateral pulmonary artery occlusion test it is indicated in pneumonectomy in patients who are having a very poor fpv1 that is less than 800 ml or which is 30 to 40 percent of normal what happens is you inflate the balloon in a uh, unilateral pulmonary artery the normal the pressure increase should somewhere be around five millimeters of mercury but when you are occluding the pulmonary artery if the pulmonary artery pressure is going more than 35 millimeters of mercury and if the pao2 when you measure by abg it is going more than 60 millimeters of mercury and the pao2 falls less than 45 millimeters of mercury then the patient is not going to be a patient to whom you operate for a pneumonectomy so these are all invasive tests like uh, uh, bronchospirometry or temp temporary pulmonary artery occlusion test these are not practice i have just told it for the theoretical point of view or uh, you when you excel in your examination some examiner may be very fond of asking about pulmonary artery occlusion even in a case of a patient who is desaturating while do a thoracotomy next is a selective bronchial occlusion test this is using a fiber optic bronchoscopy the pft is done the same thing uh, as in case of a uh, uh, PFT. Selective, uh, you occlude the bronchi and do the PFT. So we have now, so just refresh yourself because 
I think I have spoken for around one hour. Okay. So, how will you interpret a spirometry? So, as I have told earlier, whether it is restrictive or obstructive. How do you find out? You would see the Tiffany's index, FEV1 by FEC. Normally, in an obstructive disorder, it will be decreased. As you have seen in the graph earlier, the mid-expiratory flow rate will be decreased. The maximum breathing capacity will be decreased. But the total lung capacity can be normal or increased because of air trapping. The residual volume also can be increased. The vital capacity can be normal or decreased because of decrease in the FEV1 and FEC. And in case of restrictive, as I told, all lung volumes are decreased, vital capacity, total cap uh, lung capacity, residual volume. The Tiffany's index is alone is normal or increased. Mid expiratory flow rate, there is no uh, derangement. And maximum breathing capacity can be normal or decreased. So in order to assess a spirogram or a spirometry, you assess the validity and the acceptability. You determine the ventilatory pattern, grade the severity and grade the response to the bronco uh, bronchodilator challenge in an interpretation of pulmonary function test. Whenever you are given a PFT in your OSCE examination, first see the FEV1 and FEC. What is lower limit of normal is less than 5 percentage is the lower limit of normal. So it is always given as a percentage of predicted no. So less than 5 percentage is lower limit of normal. So FEV1 by FEC, you, you see if it is more than lower limit of normal, which is normal. Okay. So if it is normal, you see if the FEC is normal. FEV1 by FEC is normal. FEC is also normal. Then you come to DLCO. If the DLCO also is more than lower limit of normal, then the patient is absolutely normal. But if the FEV1 by FEC is normal, FEC is also normal, but the DLCO alone is less than predicted means, then the patient is going to have anemia or carboxyhemoglobinemia. Okay? Okay. But if the FEV1 by FEC is normal, but the FEC alone is decreased, which means the value Tiffany's index is normal, but the FEC is decreased. You see whether the total lung capacity is normal. If the total lung capacity is less than lower limit of normal, the total lung capacity is not okay. This is also decreased. FEC is decreased. The total lung capacity also is decreased. Then it is obviously a restrictive disorder. Then again, you go for DLCO. If the DLCO is normal, this is a restriction because of chest wall disorder or a neuromuscular disorder. But if DLCO itself is affected, then the lung is the pathology, then it is an interstitial lung disease. So FEV1 by FEC will be normal, FEC will be less than normal, total lung capacity will be normal, I mean will be less than normal and DLCO will be less than normal in case of an interstitial lung disease which is a restrictive disorder. Coming on to this part of the graph. FEV1 by FEC is less than normal. So when it happens is in case of an obstructive disorder. How do you define it? So you see the FEC. If the FEC is more than lower limit of normal, then it is an obstructive disorder. In an obstructive disorder, you see the DLCO. If the DLCO is normal, then it is asthma. Because in asthma, there is no parenchymal lesion. There is only obstruction. There is no parenchymal lesion. In the case of an obstruction, when there is DLCO which it's itself is decreased, then it is an emphysematous COPD wherein the basement membrane or the respiratory bronchial itself is affected. In case the FEV1 by FEC is less than normal and the FEC is also not normal, which is decreased, both are decreased, you see for the total lung capacity. If the total lung capacity is actually kind of more than normal or less than normal, then it is case of a mixed disorder. I hope I'm clear with this uh, graph because you will be given invariably given a PFT in the OSCE examination. Okay, so here are the few exercises. If one of you can um, uh, unmute yourself and uh, uh, just a second, one of you can unmute yourself from. Um, and answer the following questions. It will be helpful for your examination also. also. Anyone willing?
the previous sessions were interactive i saw the previous sessions i saw the previous sessions they were very interactive yes madam yes madam presentation now presentation now I actually have given an answer for this. So can you tell how this PFT is yeah. normal PFT? Yeah. First, which you will see is always FEV by FEC only. So here, uh, see, FEV one is here. It is 75 percent predicted. FEC is 95 percent predicted. So 75 divided by 95 somewhere close to 0.8. So that is normal. Then come to FEC. That is also normal. Then you see the total lung capacity. that is also normal so this is a normal pft suppose in this pft if they have given a dlco and if the dlco is less than predicted means then it will become an anemia or carboxyhemoglobinemia done now only if you say if you understand or not then i'll be able to proceed to the further slides because in in and then i mean it will be kind of boring because i keep talking shall i put the net, next pft any any one of you can try so uh, i'll just tell you where the fev1 and fvc is okay so that you will uh, find it easy so here the fev1 is there it is somewhere 75 percentage and uh, fvc is 60 percentage total lung capacity is fixed 56 percentage of predicted the residual volume is also less anyone will take a call for this dr demima Please try, Dr. Jemima. I mean, yes, sir. Okay. Just actually, I am having some uh, network issue. Just try and turn it off. No, I'll wait. No problem. Yeah, yeah. Someone of you can try. डॉक्टर पंकज दे आर कंफर्टेबल जैसे ही ऐसा मेंटल रेस्ट्रिक्टिव डिसीज़ ओके सी हियर ओ ओके वेयर डू आई गो फॉर द चैट बॉक्स ओके Just a second, sir. I, I, I have logged in. Uh, logged in. We have my phone also. Very nice. Can see the chat box as well. Uh, okay, Jayshree, you have typed it as a restrictive disease. So I'll just mention it because uh, FEV1 by FEC is more than normal. Um, 70 divided by 60 is more than 100, and you can see here the total lung capacity is also decreased, and residual volume. Every lung capacity is decreased. So this is a restrictive disorder. So few more examples. Yes. FEV1 by FEC is 14. You can type in the chat box if you are not comfortable because I have logged in through my phone also. FEV1 by FEC is 14. FEV1 is 12 percent predicted. FEC is 56, 57.6 percent predicted, and the total lung capacity is 115. Anyone would you give it a try? I'm just I have just logged in through my phone also. You can type in the chat box as well. That is how a teacher understands whether you understand or not. Any one of you can type in the chat box. Doctor Jimmy, no. Okay, so this is an obstructive disorder. Okay, it's a severe obstructive disorder. So, anyone would you like a try for this? See, um, I don't know if it's visible. Um, the FEV one by FEC is FEV one by FEC is seventy two. 
okay fev1 and fec is somewhere around 68 and 79 the total lung capacity is 79 the dual co normal is more than 85 80 percent predicted but here it is 47 percentage so what would this amount to fev1 by fec is reduced slightly but fev1 and fec is kind of decreased the total lung capacity is decreased the DLCO also is decreased. So it is a restrictive disorder with the diffusion defect. Okay, the diffusion is also affected because. Um, the DLCO is actually less. Okay, so here are other few more examples. As you can see, this is a uh, bronchodilator uh, reversal which you are going to see. See, FEV1 by FEC is 53. So this is an obstruction disorder. So then when you give a bronchodilator, this is pre-bronchodilator. So 70%. And after the bronchodilator therapy, it has increased to 90. What we are more worried is FEV1, that is 49% in the pre-bronchodilator and 70% in the post-bronchodilator. Okay, so uh, it is more than 12% increase. And here you can see it is 1.33 uh, liters. And uh, after the bronchodilator therapy, it has gone somewhere around 1.89 liters, which means it has increased somewhere around 500 ml and hence it has increased more than 200 ml. So it is the uh, bronchodilator reversal. So reversibility with the bronchodilator. Then this uh, PFT. So FEV1 by FEC is normal. Anyone would you like to try? See, uh, FEV1 by FEC is normal, but you see the FEF 72 to uh, 25 percentage more than A70 is normal, but it is kind of decreased here. And hence, this is a mild degree of mid airway obstruction. Others will be decreased. FEV1 by FEC is kind of maintained here. The early obstruction graph which I showed earlier, no, that part, uh, that kind of PFT. So, I have the answer for effort this. Independent part. Uh, yes, that is the effort independent part. Here I have given the answer myself because uh, some of us may, may find it difficult. See, the FEB1 by FEC, pre-bronchodilator and post-bronchodilator, there is no change. So, this is the pre, this is the post. So, predicted percentage predicted is 67. Here it is 66. There is no change. So, there is no bronchodilator reversibility. See the FEV1. It is percentage predicted is pre bronchodilator is 62, post bronchodilator is 64. So, there is no change. So, there is no reversibility with the bronchodilator. See the FEV1 by FEC percentage, it is 62 and 66. Is it kind of decreased? Obviously, it is decreased. So, what are we looking at? We are looking at a. Yes, anyone? Obstructive pathology. In case of an obstructive pathology, again go and see the total lung capacity. It is 85. Okay. Look at the residual volume. It is actually 1 or 2. It is increased. Isn't it? Look at the uh, DLCO. It is like borderline. Hello? So it is a mixed disorder wherein the lung volume. Madam, following, madam. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it is a mixed disorder. Okay. So any patient who is coming to us with COPD and kyphoscoliosis, that kind of disorder. So preoperative assessment of lung resection. This is the last part of the lecture. So why do we stratify? Is you see for, uh, like those patients who will have increased postoperative pulmonary complications, who will need elective ventilation, who can you extubate on table? 
who we need to electively ventilate for some time, assess for the RV compatibility and extubate. So how much time to extubate? I mean, how much time do we need to extubate the patient? All that you have to find out even in the preoperative period. So prior to uh, this, uh, there were so many guidelines, BTS guidelines, which gave, um, we shall discuss it later. But predicted postoperative FEV1 is the single most factor, which is the important determinant of POPC. Just a second, I log in from my mobile and log out. So single most impact, important factor for POPC. The formula which is given is the predicted post-operative FEV1 is equal to pre-operative FEV1 into 1 minus functional tissue removed by 100. So this is what is given in 8th edition Miller as well as 9th edition Miller. The total lung segments is actually divided into 42. So the right upper lobe is 6, middle lobe is 4, lower lobe is 12. The left it is 10 and 10. So the total number of segments is 42. Suppose, for example, you say the preoperative FEV1 is 80 percentage. If you are going to remove the left upper lobe, so how much is the segment? 10 segments. How much is the percentage of lung resected? 10 divided by 42. So that is 23 percentage of lung which is resected. Okay. What is the predicted postoperative FEV1? It is preoperative FEV1 that is 80 percentage into 1 minus functional tissue removed divided by 100. So 80 into 1 minus 23 divided by 100. So that is 61.6 percentage is the predicted postoperative FEV1. Okay. Okay. Then comes another example with the same segments. Say the preoperative FEV1 is 65 percentage. You are planning for a left pneumonectomy, which is a total lung removal. So how many segments will be removed? 10 plus 10. Okay, so post-operative FEV1 decrease will be 20 divided by 42. So totally 47 percentage of the lung is going to be removed. Okay, so the predicted post-operative FEV1 is 65 is the pre-operative FEV1 into 1 minus 47 divided by 100. So the predicted post-operative FEV1 is only 34.45 percentage. So these are two examples wherein the predicted postoperative FEV1 is actually, sorry, the predicted postoperative FEV1 in this example is actually 61.6 percentage and the predicted postoperative FEV1, depending upon the preoperative FEV1, it is actually 34.45 in this example. So, this is actually given, um, I don't know how many of us should follow this, but it is given an up-to-date wherein based on the CT, they have divided the lung, but what is in, given in Miller is only advisable to follow. But if someone asks you regarding if you have known any 19 segment formula, then you can say this. Uh, it is given an up-to-date only wherein the lung is divided, in the right lung is divided into 3, 2 and 5, left as 5 and 4, where the left upper lobe and the right lower lobe, if they they are removed, they are, there is going to be a major morbidity. The predicted postoperative FEV1 is preoperative FEV1 into number of segments after resection divided by 19. So you just know this formula and that is enough. This is a three legged stool which is given in the 8th edition Miller where it involves respiratory mechanics, cardiopulmonary reserve, and lung parenchymal test. So any postoperative FEV1 where we have seen in first example, no, it was 61 percentage. So it is 61 percentage and if it is 61 percentage, see the predicted postoperative FEV1 is more than 40, you extubate the patient on table after the patient has become awake, warm and comfortable. Suppose if you say it was 34.5, no, the next example it was 34. So if it is 30 to 30, uh, 40 percentage predicted postoperative FEV1, you see the excess tolerance. If the patient's VO2 max is more than 20 or if the patient's VO2 max is at least more than 15, DLCO is normal, then you consider extubating on table. Suppose if it is 30 to 40 percentage, but the VO2 max itself is somewhere around 12, then you try for like staged weaning. You wean the patient like extubate after some time. But if the predicted postoperative uh, FEV1 is less than 30, you plan for a staged weaning. Like you extubate only when the patient is awake, warm and comfortable, provided you have given a adequate analgesia via thoracic epidural or via a ESB catheter. So, 
so pre operative risk stratification this is a ninth edition miller wherein first and the foremost question you ask the patient is if the effort tolerance is more than 2 mets so if the post operative fev1 and the post operative dlco if it is more than 60 percentage you produce pr proceed with the lung resection but if it's, it's only 30 to 60 percentage you ask the patient to do a simple exercise testing in front of you if they are able to walk at least 400 meter in 6 minutes you proceed for surgery if they are not able to walk 400 meters you ask them to do a cardiopulmonary exercise testing if it is the vo2 max is less than 10 you defer them manage them medically if it is more than 10 you schedule them under increased risk suppose if the predicted post operative fev1 and dlco is less than 30 you ask the patient to do a cardiopulmonary exercise testing if the vo2 max is okay then you proceed with increased risk but if it is less than 10 ml per kg you defer them optimize them and then proceed for alternative therapies so this is what i was talking about previously the british thoracic society actually way back in 2000 now uh, one gave us if the patient's pre operative fev1 is 1.5 liters and the patient is fit to undergo a lobectomy if the patient's pre operative fev1 is more than 2 liters then the patient is fit to undergo a pneumonectomy but american college of chest physicians only gave that any patient who is undergoing a thoracic to me please look for predicted post operative fev1 if it is only more than 60 and predicted dlco is more than 60 you say that you can undergo a predicted pneumonectomy with not much increased risk but if the patient is having uh, 30 to 60 you do further testing and then decide if it is less than 30 directly go for cardiopulmonary exercise testing rule out if the patient's vo2 max is adequate and then schedule under increased risk okay so screening tool for lung resection as i told more than 40 means no respiratory complications is anticipated if it is less than 30 means increased risk of perioperative death and cardiovascular complications which is mais like hypotension uh, arrhythmias and um, uh, myocardial infarction following a non cardiac surgery and if it is less than 10 then the patient is i mean less than 30 then the patient is likely to require a post operative elective ventilation and increased risk of death and complication and hence non surgical management should be tried the same goes for uh, transfer capacity also okay so the predictors of morbidity are the pre operative fev1 less than 40 inability to walk to 50 meters on two occasions when the vo2 max is less than 10 ml per kg per minute when the pre operative dlco itself is abnormal then these are the predictors of morbidity and morbidity following a pneumonectomy or a lobectomy so hence to summarize the pulmonary function test is a bedside test can be done a subrasus breath holding or a single breath count or a debenos whistle peak expiratory flow meter forced expiratory time cough test and snider's match blowing test and the test which involves lung mechanics are the uh, static lung volumes and capacities and the dynamic test can include volume time loop flow volume loop and pressure volume loop the parenchyma malfunction can be test for gaseous exchange as in case of dlco or arterial blood gas analysis wherein you get the alveolar arterial gradient and the cardiopulmonary reserve on the whole is tested by 6 minutes walk test or shuttle walk test or cardiopulmonary exercise testing and this is useful in the pre operative risk stratification and decision making for lung resection surgeries not only lung resection surgeries but cardiac surgery any transplant surgery if the patient is if the patient were to undergo a liver transplant then again you have to risk stratify them for a popc and it is useful in determining whether the patient has got an obstructive disorder or a restrictive disorder by volume time loop or a flow volume loop and cardiopulmonary exercise testing is a simple non invasive measure to predict your cardiac and your non cardiac outcomes thank you